Welcome back everybody to the Carlette Christmas Show. This morning we're dealing with a subject that has really taken on a life of its own and that is bullying. What is bullying? When do we know our kids or when do we even know as adults that we're being bullied? And have we taken the word bullying and ascribed it to everything that happens to us that maybe we don't agree with? Well, our guest this morning has been doing the work she and her organization for decades now. And she joins us to, to break down bullying, what we need to know and understand, and how we can help people that feel like they're being bullied. Our guest this morning is Judy French. She is the coordinator for the National Bullying Prevention Center, uh, also known as P PACERS. Judy, good morning and welcome. Good morning. Thank you for having me. So this is an important conversation because every time we hear about a school shooting or we hear about a workplace shooting, sometimes it's connected to bullying. First of all, let's talk about how the word bullying has become more nuanced. Yes, I, I think it's really important actually to break down uh, for folks tuning in that there isn't one consistent definition of bullying out there. So there isn't one idea about bullying out there. We're getting better. We're coming towards a consistent definition. But I find that most adults are still relying on what they were told uh, about bullying when they were children. And so if you don't mind, let me break it down sure. to what the definition is. And what we've done here uh, at the National Bullying Prevention Center is taking the very best definitions and pulled out the commonalities. So we call them the hallmarks of the very best definitions. Uh, and by very best, I mean they're coming from organizations who are relying on research, relying on studies okay. regarding child, childhood bullying. So here's the definition. It's hurt or harm with words or actions. And obviously that hurt or harm could be to body or mind or feelings. The target really cannot stop what is happening to them because they don't have the same amount of power as the person or people doing the bullying. So hurt or harm to, with words or actions, target can't stop it because there's a power imbalance where the person or group doing the bullying has more power. Now, two things are missing from there that I need to bring up because they'll be a feature of every legal definition. One is intention. So we used to say hurt or harm done on purpose, but we're realizing now that intention is a very tricky thing and can sometimes hold up uh, what's happening in terms of fixing a bullying situation. So we, for children with disabilities, which is where Pacer Center uh, has most of their work, it may be difficult for them to, do, to ever figure out what intention is. And for a lot of adults after the fact, trying to do some detective work on the situation, intention is also quite difficult. We don't hang our hats on the intention piece. We want people to think about impact. If we can't figure out intention, if the kid says, oh, it's just a joke, he just right. took it wrong, or he's too sensitive, or, well, you know, this seat is safe. We can look at the impact of that action on the target. The other thing that's missing here that will also be a feature of every legal definition, as in your school policy or district policy, is repetition. And that is tricky for us, too, coming from a disability advocacy perspective, because um, for children or anyone who believes that a threat is imminent, you only have to make that threat once, and then their life has changed. Their perception of their safety in a school community has changed. So hurt or harm. Uh, done with words or action, target can't stop it because uh, they don't have the same amount of power. And other features that, that people may see out there in the world are intention and repetition. So that and, is the basic breakdown. <laughs> sure. And so I, I think that feels like a slippery slope for people who may be listening and watching, especially when you're talking about kids, hurt or harm. I get that. But where is the line sort of because now with children with disabilities we could say a child who does not have disabilities may have more power but for children that are on the same level peer peer to peer 
no disabilities. Mm -hmm. um, I've heard parents say, you know, this kid just keeps picking at my child every day. Yeah. What gives well, one person more power over the other? So power in kid world could be a variety of things, some of which we could relate to. Um, uh, it could be that someone knows the secret about me that I don't want told to anyone. It could be that someone is physically stronger. It could be numerical that there's, a, you know, three kids, you know, coming after me. I'm just one. Um, there's a variety of things that it could be. It could be social dominance. That's very, uh, very likely as well. Uh, or someone who wants to be socially dominant. Uh, so that happens. But I want to make a distinction really quickly between conflict and bullying. Okay. Um, because that's where the line gets crossed. Um, in conflict, the people involved have equal power. They tend to be playing the same game. Sometimes one might be dominant, sometimes the other. Or they tell each other what to do. And sometimes there's big feelings involved. Uh, but when, in conflict, when a child understands that what they've done has hurt or harm to the other child. And I'm not saying this happens easily. They need, sure. you know, the support and understanding from us. But generally, they modify their behavior when they find out that what they've done has hurt the other child because they do not want to lose a friend. Yeah, most kids know uh, that having a friend or being in a group is protective. And it just feels better. It's just more fun. Belonging is such a huge driver of kids' social world and adults, too. Uh, so with conflict, if I find out I've done something to you, I I'm going to try and, and, in my best kid way, fix it or modify it. With bullying, and this is where that picking thing comes in, if I figure out that what I have done has bothered you, then I'm going to keep pushing that button because I can. You right. really can't stop it. For mm -hmm. whatever reason, you cannot stop it, and I'm going to keep doing that. I get a sense of satisfaction and control from it. And you're bothered. That's how I know. Mm -hmm. You know, that's how I know that I've got it. Um, I have hit that button. So right. the difference is, is that when I know that I've hurt or harmed you, I don't stop. Wow. I keep going. Okay. And again, that power imbalance lets me do it. Okay. That, that's very important. And for parents who are watching, who are dealing with bullying and have said, and I think that, that these definitions have to be very clear, yeah. you know, because then the parent goes to the school and says, this child is consistently um, creating a conflict. They know it's a conflict and they continue. And depending on what the school's policy is, you know, the principal or the administration says, they, they need to figure it out. Right. The thing is, with bullying, which is not conflict, uh, it is never the child's responsibility to fix the situation. With conflict, yes, we, that's how kids build resilience. They figure out what, what tools they need, and they figure it out because we show them, and we help them and support them. But with bullying, most often bullying situations will not resolve in a healthy way uh, until a caring adult gets involved. And that's because of that power imbalance. It's because of there needs to be repair and restoration, but kids cannot work it out. And that advice still happens today. Oh, you guys just need to go right. shake hands. Or, you know, in the old days, uh, they would tell kids to go fight it out. I mean, literally, yeah, go, go fight it out. Your beef, settle your beef. Out, you know, that re victimizing the target is not where we want to be. We need to support the children involved. Um, so in a 360 kind of way, we need to really come together as adults to figure out why this situation is happening. And it would be a lot easier for the adults in question for it to be conflict. Uh, then we can put some things into play and they can work it out and build some tools, you know, uh, for their for their conflict resolution toolbox. But it's not the same in bullying. In bullying, because there's been this, there's this power imbalance. We can't ask the target to be present in the same way as they would in, in conflict. In fact, they don't have to be. They shouldn't have to be. Adults have to get in there and help support through this situation. So it's a lot of work. Absolutely. Uh, but your, but the child, children have a right to be safe at school. And I know that sounds like something incredibly obvious. But when there's a situation that is unresolved, even if it's conflict, 
we have to step in and not just promote, you know, better relationship building, but also show them what that looks like. Absolutely. Modeling. Absolutely. Yeah. Welcome back everybody to the Carlette Christmas Show. Our guest this morning is Judy French and she's the coordinator for the National Bullying Prevention Center. And we're talking about bullying and how to help parents understand, and not only parents, but adults as well, what bullying is, what it isn't, and bigger than that, conflict resolution, because a lot of young people especially don't understand conflict resolution. And, you, and to your point in the last segment, you said adults need to get in and they need to be the mediators for a lot of what we're seeing. Tell us a little bit more about that. Well, there's some great programs out there that, 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 that help kids understand building healthy relationships. But fundamentally, if kids aren't seeing healthy social behavior, it's very mm -hmm. difficult for them to know what to do. So whatever programs, I mean, there's some pretty famous uh, programs for conflict resolution that people are using now. Uh, and they're wonderful, uh, but, but it isn't just teaching. Those lessons aren't, you know, they don't just occur during class time or, or teaching minutes. They have to, kids have to be seeing us enact healthy social behavior. That's how they learn what to do. So I guess what I'm saying is adults have to model the behaviors that they would like to be seeing. And we have to do it intentionally. Mm -hmm. uh, it can't be a random act of kindness. It has to be very intentional that, that we know that that's a part of intersecting with the life of a child that we are going to be demonstrating. And when we screw up, because we do, because we're human beings, that we show them how to repair and resolve in a healthy way. And if need be, how to walk away with respect uh, and you know, a sense of integrity um, that is, a, you know, very scarce in the world right now in in adult mm, world. Yes, uh, and so kids really aren't aren't seeing that. Um, so I think for me, the linchpin of um, you know positive social behavior that creates a community where bullying doesn't flourish or take hold is that acceptance of difference piece. Mm. If bullying revolves around a real or perceived difference. If I know that calling you gay or whatever bothers you, I'm going to do that. It doesn't have to be true. But again, it's that acceptance of difference piece uh, that bullying latches on to. Mm -hmm. So if you're in a community where people are like, you know, everyone is accepted here. Here's how we relate to one another. If we're in conflict, here's how we repair it. Mm -hmm. That's a place where bullying, um, you know, really can't take a hold in the same way because people are more connected and less likely to want to hurt one another. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And where acceptance is acceptance, there is bullying dies. It, it can't thrive there. I think, you know, I, I think because every day human beings are in development and trying things out, especially for kids, mm -hmm. there will always be mistakes made with relationships, you know, but I think that because um, I've seen it in communities, in school communities, where the kids themselves, the peers themselves, shut it down. We don't talk like that here. Yeah, we don't call him uh, a spaz or stupid or whatever. He, this is, you know, this is John, and this mm -hmm. is how he acts when we love him, you know, or, or some equivalent of it. But I've seen school communities where the bullying referrals drop way down. And by, by referrals, I mean, you know, sending kids sure. to the office for mm -hmm. discipline or problems or whatever, they, 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 they go way down because first of all, the lines of communication uh, between kid world and the adults are clear and clean and open. And there's a lot of you know um, discussion and dialogue. So we're, we know what's going on in mm -hmm. land. But also the kids are, again, engaging in healthy relationship building. And so yeah. the, the, the big piece, because that bullying is one piece in schools, but what about the advent of social me media and cyberbullying? Yeah, well, you know, here again, I'm going to lay some responsibility at the feet of adults uh, because wh while the research tells us that for most children, they will not be bullied 
online or, or through uh, technology without a face-to-face -face contact first. I mean, it's very rare actually for kids to be bullied online without you know having some mm -hmm. real life component to that. But adults seem to be able to, you know, they want to, they'll go after anybody, stranger or whatever in the comments section. It's quite entertaining sometimes and quite demoralizing others to see what people will do. So when I got my phone, nobody sat down with me to tell me, you know, what or talk about what's an ethical use of that technology. Nobody sat down with me when I got online, and I suspect the same for you, to say, who are you going to be online? Right. <laughs> that digital citizenship piece incredibly important who you know this is who you are in real life so who are you going to portray yourself online mm. because you can be anonymous you can be hurtful so easily and all that hurt and pain can go out to thousands of people hundreds of thousands maybe millions if you have a lot of followers so, so who are you going to be those choices you make daily the per person you are daily are you, are you be that person online uh, so those talks need to happen between adults and kids, and they are happening. But very often, um, kids are getting into uh, pieces of technology or online, like gaming. There's a messaging component in every game. And some of those things aren't seen. You know, there's not adult eyes there to oversee the behavior. Um, I have parents asking all the time, like, oh, my kid loves this game, but the, the, the kids he's involved with are, are so mean and, talk, right. you know, trash talking and horrible. Mm -hmm. and, and he's just feeling nervous and anxious about the whole thing. So what do we do? You know, adult eyes, again, um, just as face-to-face -face bullying, you know there are places where there are fewer adult eyes at school. That's the place we need to put more adult eyes to see. And yeah, I, and same and with I, online. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think you're... You're absolutely on point. And the, the thing that has to happen for all adults, especially in this political culture that we all live in, is that our actions and our words, they matter. And yeah. our kids are watching and they are just really replicating what they see, whether it's at home or whether the, what their parents you know, believe in and support and they're taking it into schools and into into their spheres. And so, you know, this conversation is not going to end here. It's a it's a large conversation. And I think we all have to be careful the way we approach situations because our kids are watching and, and they're they're just little miniature us us's you know they, they do what they see us do you know and they I don't say sometimes, you yeah know, well, well parents, parents will express frustration like that because they are watching and we do make mistakes as well and and sometimes you get a family dynamic where things just really are not working right so reset you know that's the you know if you've missed the opportunity to create a family agreement around how technology is going to be used and what to do when things happen that are negative. For instance, a child being bullied or a child participating in something that's hurt other children uh, online or, or through messaging, whatever it is, social media. That's the time to sit down and say, this isn't working for us. We are all just so upset over this situation. Uh, and so we need to find a way. And so involving the child in the solution is critically important because kids don't want their technology taken away and they will not come to us if they think that's what we're going to do. So we've got to be careful. If you've missed the opportunity though to, to, to set that up when your kids are little, uh, reset <laughs> and sit down as a family um, and figure that stuff out. It's critically important. 